So Alexander Yusek repeats his win over Anthony Joshua. There was no revenge here for AJ, only more heartbreak. Heartbreak as well as a bizarre Kanye West style meltdown in the ring after the fight. <laughs> but more about that in a separate video. Now, this was a fantastic performance by Alexander Usyk. When Usyk first moved up to heavyweight and he beat Chaz Witherspoon, people were very critical. People were saying that he was too small. Then he fought Derek Chisora and people were even more critical. And if you go back and listen to my post fight, video following the Yusik Chizora fight, I was telling people that you underestimate Yusik at your peril. They were saying that he's supposed to get Chizora out of there. This guy is washed up. How could he have such a tough time and go to distance with someone so limited and what have you? And I was explaining at the time that Chizora fights in a style which is nothing like an Anthony Joshua. <laughs> it's nothing like a Tyson Fury. Styles make fights. There are going to be certain guys who have a style that actually gives you more problems. And I'm talking about guys who are not elite that give you more problems than the elite guys. So I saw that and I always felt like Usyk would be a problem for all the big men. I've been predicting for the longest while that between Usyk and Michael Hunter, they will turn over several of the top names in the division. And I'm talking about the big men. I've been saying this for a while and I still believe that by the way with Hunter too. Don't think that he ain't gonna cause an upset because that's coming. And I know people are writing him off because of the Jerry Forrest fight. Well, that's why it's going to be an upset when he, <laughs> when he does it. <laughs> that's how upsets happen. When guys don't have good performances, people start underestimating them. You never see them coming. You know, anyway, Usyk's performance here in the rematch with AJ, it was more the same from Usyk, really. You see, Usyk is a complete fighter. He's very rounded. He showed what he could do in the first fight, the movement the foot movement, the head movement, the angles, the variation of punches, different types of jab, body shots, you know, hooks, uh, it, the whole range of skills were on display in the first fight. And he put them on display in the second fight as well, along with showing a great set of whiskers. I think that, yes, Usyk is good at riding punches and not taking them completely flush. And he knows how to keep his hands up and you know, move his head in such a way that he's not getting hit completely clean. But nevertheless, he's obviously got good punch resistance because there are plenty of fighters out there who get clipped with the kind of shots he, he's been clipped with by AJ and they're on wobbly legs or they're going down. Whereas with Alexander Usyk, he was able to stand firm. And there were some tough moments in this fight because AJ was a lot more determined this time around. He came with a steely determination. You could see it in his face on the ring walk. You could see it in his face throughout the fight. He had this almost angry look in his eyes. And that's a good thing for Anthony Joshua. He's going to need, if he continues to box, he's going to need to stay with that mentality. Yeah. He's going to stay, need to stay with the mean mentality in the ring. All of the nice guy stuff, forget about that. Uh, he, his training team have definitely done a good job in getting more meanness out of AJ but there's even more meanness that they can get out of him moving forward, you know, where he can be more aggressive because that's really the mistake. One of the mistakes that AJ made in this fight, I'll come on to that in a moment. But as for Usyk, early on in the fight, AJ wasn't giving him as much because AJ's guard was a lot tighter and his foot positioning was better. He wasn't pouring with his jab. His body language was more positive and this made Usyk more wary. Okay, you, uh, AJ was also looking for a right-hand counter a lot of the time over Usyk's backhand. And again, he was looking to counterpunch the counterpunch shot. I mean, Usyk is not really a pure counterpuncher. He does counter, but he also leads off a lot. So because of AJ's much tighter guard this time, and that's really uh, a classic uh, you know, thing that Robert Garcia fighters tend to have is a tight guard. So AJ had this real tight guard. Usyk wasn't able to penetrate it that easily. And AJ's body positioning was such that it was, and his foot positioning was such that it wasn't as easy to even pot shot him as it was first time around. You know, he was keeping a certain distance. And Usyk just moved around and he was looking for AJ to start getting frustrated. He wanted AJ to start reaching with his punches so that then he could counter him. But he'd need to tire AJ out a bit first. And the thing about Alexander Usyk, similar with Vasyl Lomachenko, is that they can tire you out with their movement 
even without hitting you because you're having to track them all over the place. And his head's moving, his feet are moving, his hands are moving. And you, you're looking at all these different moving parts. And after a few rounds, particularly with Lomachenko, you know, a few years ago, the fighter would just get completely discombobulated and dizzy. It would scramble their senses. It's almost like sensory overload because there are too many things to watch in terms of what the opponent is doing. That causes mental fatigue. And that's when, bam, he comes in and hits you with a real hard shot. And, that's, and once you go into that mental confusion, uh, Lomachenko would turn up the pressure, turn up the heat and really stick it on you. And Usyk is similar to that. He tries to do uh, you know, a similar kind of thing. And that's what he was looking for against AJ when AJ wasn't giving him the opportunities that he did in the first fight early on, where Usyk was able to land flush shots like within the first 10, 15 seconds in the first fight. This time around, AJ's guard was real tight and AJ wasn't pawing. He was just throwing solid shots all the time. So Usyk knew he had a more confident man and a more angry man, a more determined man, a man who, went, who was coming in there with a mentality of trying to hurt him, not trying to box with him. So Usyk had to be careful, and he was. But as the fight progressed, Usyk got what he wanted. AJ started to tire. Not like he completely gassed out in the fight because he didn't. In fact, his stamina appeared better this time than last time. But he did start to tire. His hands started to drop a little bit. His guard wasn't as tight. He started losing his shape. And that's when Usyk was able to start getting through with more punches. Now, of course, AJ did have a very good round, and AJ was landing good body shots. Throughout the fight, he was targeting the body. and. Uh, Usyk had to be co cognizant of that. He tried to go back to AJ's body when he could. But again, that counter right hand from AJ was there. So Usyk started going with right hooks to the body uh, when the opportunity presented itself. But as I say, Usyk's movement eventually starts making you go cross-eyed <laughs> or bog-eyed. The hands moving, the head moving, the feet moving, the upper body moving. You start going cross-eyed. It didn't happen with AJ that badly, but it was happening a little bit. And when you're a big guy, I mentioned this during the live commentary, you'd be surprised how difficult it is for a big muscular man to keep his hands up and to keep his guard tight for 12 rounds. When you're a little welterweight or a lightweight or a featherweight, you can keep your hands up a lot better right? for the 12. You can't expect a heavyweight that size with big, you know, thick arms to keep their hands up for the, it's difficult. Yeah. A Mike Tyson is a small heavyweight, short arms, easier to keep the hands up. A big guy with 82 inch reach is real hard to keep your hands up for the 12. That's why a lot of fighters, particularly, particularly heavyweights, they fight with a lead hand down or, they, or at least for certain points in a fight or for long stretches in a the fight, they'll have their hands down and then other times they'll have them up because it's hard for heavyweights. This is what people don't understand. As a heavyweight, I'm talking from experience, all right? It's hard to keep your hands up for a long time. So, um, yeah, as I say, AJ's guard started to loosen. He started to get a little confused by Usyk's movement. And that's when Usyk was able to land his shots. And also AJ, after having that real good round, I think it was in the ninth, was it? He expended a lot of energy there. And Usyk knew what George Foreman always used to say. Once a big guy has emptied the tank on you, you need to jump on him. That's the time when the big guy is most vulnerable, is after he's emptied his tank. And that's exactly what Usyk did. Not in that same round, but in the following round, he came on and he stuck it. He came out and stuck it on AJ. And uh, he had AJ wobbling a little bit. But again, if there's one positive, I mean, there are several positives, but one of the positives that you can take from this fight for AJ is that he held it together mentally better when he was being hit, when he was under pressure. Previous to this, every time I've seen AJ get hit with shots and under pressure, he has the look of a victim on his face. Do you know what I mean? Like when he went down against Sandy Ruiz and he was on, the, on one knee on the canvas, he looked like a victim. He didn't have steely determination in his eyes when he was getting off the canvas. You know, he looked like a guy that had, didn't know what had hit him and he was shocked and he, he just looked like uh, a deer in the headlights, you know, or, or a rabbit in the headlights. This time around, he didn't really get hurt the same way that he did against Ruiz or, you know, even Klitschko. Probably not hurt as badly as he did in the first fight against Usyk, but he did get buzzed several times. He was getting clipped in the last couple of rounds of the fight. But look at AJ's eyes. It was different. He was determined. You know, he wasn't there to be a victim. So I think that was an improvement. And again, that is kudos to AJ's team for getting him into that kind of mindset. And they need to build on that because he's going to need that kind of mindset 
for all of his fights now moving forward if he can, decides to continue boxing. But anyway, Yusik came back, responded fantastically in, in that next round, stuck it on AJ, who'd obviously emptied his tank. AJ did well to survive it. And then, you know, in the final few rounds, Yusik pressed home his advantage and took the decision, a well-earned decision. I personally had it. Um, let me get my phone here. Those of you who watched the live stream, well, you know what my scorecard was. I think it was 117 to 112. That's how I had it. I'm looking at it now. My scorecard was 117, 112 to Alexander Usyk, which funny enough, wasn't, wasn't much difference to my, different to my scorecard in the first fight. So although most of us are sitting here saying AJ did better this time around, yeah, he did better in some ways, but on the scorecards, I don't really think he did that much better. He did more damage. That's what I'll say. He did more damage to Usyk, but in terms of, let me talk about the positives first. AJ had a better mentality this time around. His guard was much tighter. His punches were more purposeful. His foot positioning was often better. Wasn't wasting shots. He was trying to make every shot count. His counter punching with the right hand was good. I feel like there wasn't enough left hands from AJ though. The left hand could have been a good counter, the left hand to the body or even the left uppercut. But still, there were improvements there. The jab also. He landed some solid jabs in this fight. In the previous fight, it was more pouring jabs. And it's hard to land a jab against a southpaw, but there was definitely an improvement there with AJ managing to land solid jabs on Usyk more than the first fight. But the negatives for AJ here, still extremely upright, didn't apply enough pressure. And as I've said earlier, I don't mean necessarily throw more punches because a guy that size, you know, AJ was uh, having his rant after the fight in the ring talking about he can't throw as many punches as whoever, Joe Frazier or Joe Lewis, because he's you know, a much bigger man. Um, but applying more pressure doesn't necessarily mean throwing more punches. It just means forcing your opponent to move more than he wants to, and at times when he doesn't want to. It's called ring generalship. It's called controlling the pace of the action. You come in and you look so menacing, and you, you know, you're cocking your right hand, and you've got a jab, real, real solid jab, the guy wants to move out the way, particularly when you're coming at him with this real tight guard that he can't get through, you know, and your jab is, is hitting him before he even gets into range and you're coming forward on him. And then when you are up close, you're roughing him around on the inside. That makes the guy want to move away. It's a psychological game you're playing, you see, and that's what AJ needed to do more. He needed to apply more pressure. There was far too much standing off. In fact, there's a guy uh, from my element group, Danny, shout out to Danny. We were kind of debating the tactics that AJ should use in a rematch. And he felt that AJ should box in a similar way to last time, but just have a more positive mindset. And when he manages to hit Usyk with a shot, he should follow up. And he was picking AJ to win the rematch. And what I was arguing with him is that no, AJ can't win the fight standing off. The only way he wins the fight is if he applies constant pressure. You can't stand off and give Usyk all that time to move around and, you know, take breathers and do whatever, he punch as much as he wants or as little as he wants. You can't beat him doing that. You have to stay on him. There's no other way right? for a guy of AJ's ability anyway. And where AJ's at technically at this point in his career, there's no other way to beat him other than staying on him. And AJ didn't do that. He gave him too much time and space. And that was a big mistake. So yeah, not enough pressure, still very upright, not changing the levels, you know, bending his knees to get up and down more. Um, and of course, I want to say that uh, no, AJ threw enough jabs, I would say, you know, he, he, he jabbed when he could, uh, but not enough rough stuff on the inside. I'm not saying it needs to break the rules, but there wasn't enough up close engagements, you know, and again, that comes with applying more pressure. If you apply more pressure, you, there's going to be more body contact and you'll get the chance to move him around in the clinches and all that kind of stuff. Slip little shots in here and there. There were a couple moments where he did it, but nowhere near enough. So. AJ is far from the complete fight. And this is why I'm not one of these people who thinks AJ should retire. If AJ had reached the peak of his ability, if, he, if there's nothing more you could do with his physical gifts, then I would say maybe consider retirement, particularly if he was getting knocked out. But he hasn't been getting knocked out. His last two fights, he lost on points to an extremely good boxer, an elite boxer. And, you know, he hasn't reached from, as far as I can see, the zenith in terms of maximizing his potential. I think he's got more there. He just needs the right trainer to bring it out of him. Robert Garcia might be the guy. 
I think he should stay with Robert Garcia for a, at least a couple more fights, have some learning fights and see how it goes. Yeah, maybe have some fights in the States, see how it goes. And if it doesn't work out with Rob Garcia, you know, find another trainer. But the next trainer he finds, if he doesn't stick with Rob Garcia, the next trainer he finds, he needs to st stick with them for the rest of his, of his career. That's what he needs to do, in my opinion. And no disrespect to Angel Fernandez, but he doesn't have the experience to be the head coach. Rob Garcia needs to be the head coach, not Fernandez. Fernandez can hold the spit bucket, no disrespect. I'm sure he's a great trainer for other people. But for AJ, I just don't feel like he should be on the same level as Rob Garcia. Rob Garcia needs to be the man, the voice. Yeah, not Angel Fernandez chipping in. That's my two cents. And uh, get the best out of Anthony Joshua. You know, take him as far as he can possibly go. Does that mean he'll ever become undisputed champion? Does that mean he'll ever beat Tyson Fury or Wilder or Usyk or any of these guys? Possibly not. But it still means he can be better than he is right now, in my view. Now, as for Usyk, well, what a fantastic career he's had up to date. Undisputed cruiserweight. He's beat so many people in their backyards. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, he don't get enough credit for that. The Tyson Fury fans love to bang on about how he beat Klitschko and he beat Wilder in their backyard, which he did, which he deserves a lot of credit for. But what about Usyk? I mean, this guy has gone to everybody's backyard and taken their titles off him. <laughs> and he, and in, in the heavyweight division, of course, he's a smaller guy, right? So absolutely fantastic first ballot Hall of Famer without a shadow of a doubt. There is a very strong argument to be made that Alexander Usyk is better as a cruiserweight, at least, than Evander Holyfield. You know, you could say that he's, uh, that he's the number one cruiserweight of all time and Holyfield is too. I know you, you, know, you can debate it, but there's definitely a strong argument to say that he's the number one. And in terms of what Usyk has done as a heavyweight so far, he's, better, he's done better than Holyfield at this stage of his heavyweight run. Because Holyfield, when he moved up to heavyweight, he fought a bunch of... Uh, you know, B and C level fighters first before challenging for the title against Buster Douglas. Buster Douglas wasn't as good as Anthony Joshua. Yeah, Buster Douglas was maybe more fluid than AJ and he had, you know, a certain amount of ability. But Buster Douglas was a guy that, I mean, it, people talk about AJ not having the kind of spirit and confidence that uh, Usyk has or Tyson Fury. Buster Douglas was worse than that, bro. <laughs> if you only know Buster Douglas from the Mike Tyson fight, and you really don't know Buster Douglas because that's not how he was. His dad used to get so frustrated with him, Bill Douglas. He used to get so frustrated with him because Buster was more like his mum. He was kind of a kind, sweet-hearted person. And that's no good in a boxing ring. <laughs> you know, his dad was more mean. His dad was like a light heavyweight contender. Yeah, he used to get real frustrated that Buster wasn't mean enough. And he actually trained Buster early in his career, and they ended up splitting up because his dad was so frustrated by the lack of meanness in his son. And he'd obviously lost multiple fights. And I think it was after the Tony Tucker fight where uh, Douglas's dad said, nah, I can't, I, can't, I can't train you no more. You just don't have the, the meanness in you. So the one night when he fought Tyson and he was emotionally charged up by the loss of his mother, who he was very close to, closer to his mom than he was to his dad, that was the one night where he actually brought out the meanness to go with his talent, because Buster Douglas did have talent. So it's, it's not just a matter of looking at Douglas's physical ability. You have to look at his mental ability and his emotional state. And overall, he wasn't as formidable as Anthony Joshua. Certainly not the version of Douglas that Holyfield fought. So the point I'm making is, Usyk beat a better champion than Holyfield did to become world champion. Although, you know, Holyfield was undisputed in one fight when he beat Douglas. But just looking at the quality of the guy that he beat, Usyk's ahead of Holyfield at this stage in terms of his heavyweight run. So fantastic for Usyk. Now, obviously, the thing that we all want to see next, or we all should want to see next, if we're real boxing friends, is the undisputed fight with Tyson Fury. Now, Tyson Fury took to social media after the fight and predictably called <laughs> AJ and Usyk bums and said it was rubbish and whatever, whatever. Good. And, but, well, I say good because that should mean that he wants to come out and fight Usyk, right? And unify it. But then he started talking about, you better get a checkbook out and it has to be a huge figure and you know all this kind of thing. I don't want to hear that from Fury. I don't want to hear him start demanding ridiculous sums that nobody can come up with. Let's just get the fight on. Let's just get an undisputed champion so that there is no more debate. So we can put
put the debate to rest and say, this guy is the number one. He holds all the belts. He's the man who beat the man. That's it. You know, and this is really history for Usyk to fight uh, Tyson Fury. You know, we haven't had an undisputed champion at heavyweight with all four belts ever. So here it is. This is the time to do it. <laughs> and if Usyk was able to beat Tyson Fury, and in fact, Usyk said something in the Pro's Fight press conference. I don't know whether it was a mistranslation or whatever, you know, translating Usyk's words, that if he doesn't get to fight Tyson Fury, then there's no reason to fight on. Words to that effect is what I heard. So is it a case of Usyk thinking about retirement now, or is he just emphasizing how important the undisputed fight is? That that's why he's going to fight on, because he wants to have the undisputed fight. And if he were to have the undisputed fight and beat Fury, I could fully understand why he you know, may retire after that. Because what is he, like 33 or something now? And he's been fighting for God knows how long, you know, Olympic gold medalist and undisputed cruiserweight and fighting people in their backyards, stepping up to heavyweight, beat the unified champion, beat him again in the rematch. Then if he goes in with Tyson Fury, the WBC champion, and well, now he's Ring Magazine champion as well, isn't he, Usyk? Goes in with Tyson Fury, WBC champion. If he manages to win the undisputed, I mean, what more is there to achieve? Now, from a selfish boxing fan perspective, I wouldn't want Usyk to retire at that stage because there are so many matchups out there. There are so many young, hungry, up-and-coming fighters. There's the Joe Joyce, there's the Philip Hergovich, there's, I mean, maybe even Zhang, right? There's uh, Jared Anderson, there's Joseph Parker, or, you know, we'll talk about him maybe at a separate time. Uh, there are so many matchups to be made that Usyk could be involved in. Michael Hunter rematch, you know, down the line somewhere. So uh, Deontay Wilder, of course, how could I forget him? Andy Ruiz. So there are lots and lots of exciting fights that Usyk could be in. As a selfish boxing fan, I wouldn't want him to retire if he became undisputed by beating Fury. But I would respect his decision if he did, because you've got all the belts. You've beat the guy who's already beat Wilder. You've beat Joshua. You know, you're of, I don't want to say an older generation, but there are lots of younger fighters in the division than Usyk. Lots of fighters who haven't accomplished as much as he has, who haven't been in the game as long. So I could respect if he retired at that stage. So let's hope that Tyson Fury is sensible and we can get the undisputed fight on and may the best man win. This is for supremacy in the division. This is to establish once and for all who the champion really is. And if it's Tyson Fury, all kudos to him. Hats off. You're the man. If it's Alexander Usyk, same deal. Let's just get the fight on so we can put all the debate and all the rubbish to bed. Let me know what you guys think in the comments below. Hopefully you enjoyed my video. Until next time, I'm out. If you're tired of the biased narratives and mass censorship on mainstream platforms and you want to be part of a community of critical thinkers who love free speech just as much as you do, then come and join me on Patreon and access my weekly no holds barred censorship free podcast where we lift the lid on a wide variety of controversial topics. It's not mainstream friendly. It's not politically correct, but that's the whole point. We dare to stand as a beacon of reason against an army of insanity. Just head on over to my Patreon page and select the tier called Hatman Hot Topics. You'll gain access to a minimum of two hours of exclusive content every single week, including podcasts, videos, interviews, live stream Q&As, as well as my popular Confessions of a Nightclub Bouncer series. Not to mention a vast back catalog of hundreds of hours of previous episodes. You can listen via the Patreon app with the option to download in high quality MP3. We've also got an element group where you can come and chat and hang out with myself and other members. Unlike Discord, it has full end-to-end -end encryption, it's decentralized, and it's 100% censorship free. You can also send voice notes as well as much larger audio and video files than you can on Discord. So come and sign up on Patreon. There's no contract, there's no commitment, you can cancel at any time, and it's cheaper than a cup of coffee. So I'll see you over there.
I'm out.